U.S. stock futures are down this morning. The Dow Jones Industrial Average feature, uh, futures rather fell 0.95%, while the S&P 500 and NASDAQ futures both dropped over 1%. Yeah, as inflation continues, many are looking for ways to grow their money in the stock market. But when is the right time to buy? Some analysts suggest waiting until a stock falls. It's also known as buying the dip. Here for more analysis is Joe Saluzzi. He's a partner and co-founder of Femis Trading. It's good to see you. Hi, guys. Nice so um, it's interesting how that was written because in my 19 years on Wall Street, we never recommended anybody try and time the market. We never recommended looking at the stock market just purely based on its activity or its gyrations and saying, yeah, this is a good time to buy or this is a good time to sell, especially for retail investors, right? Because retail investors consistently over time make the wrong decisions without the help of a financial advisor such as yourself. So explain what buying on weakness, not buying the dip, I hate that term. What does buying on weakness means and why is it not a good strategy for a retail small investor? Right, and I think you're saying the uh, investor versus trader. Mm -hmm. And that's really the key here. For investors, we're looking long-term, we're looking at 401ks, and we're seeing you know dips in the market as potentially a good thing for our averages. But for traders, buying the dip has been a strategy that they used for years, I would say, prior to this recent sell-off that we had this year. And it was almost a joke on Wall Street where they would buy, you know, it would dip and they would buy them and they'd go right back up. It was mm -hmm. almost like this levitating movement. Mm -hmm. And that levitation was the Federal Reserve, by the way, and the free money with the fiscal stimulus on the government side as well. The opposite of buying the dip is selling the rip. So that, that, so that means that when they run up too high, get rid of them. And, and you, you know, it's really a mentality amongst the traders. But again, I think the difference is investing versus trading. Who are you? What are you looking to do? Right, because the distinction, and it's a good one that you make, Joe, the distinction between trading and investing. Uh, traders are looking to exploit weaknesses or gains in the market almost on a day-to-day -day basis, even hour by hour in some instances. Yeah. The really, really good ones, yeah. especially uh, even institutional traders, mm -hmm. will sometimes look at the market over the course of a couple of hours and make investment decisions Rapidly yeah. and very, very quickly. But when we're talking about investing, and investing is, we pointed out here, to earn money over the long term, it's not the right strategy to employ. Right. And I would even go so far as to say it's not even just hourly by hourly or minute by minute, second by second millisecond by millisecond. Mm -hmm. There's such a thing called these high-frequency traders, which are just right. machines flipping back and forth, mm -hmm. and they could care less with who the CEO is or what the company does for a living. It's, can I buy it at a penny and sell it at two pennies within a millisecond, mm -hmm. and I'll do that a million times a day? That's not investing, right. right? That's hyperactive trading that adds no value to the market, in my opinion. But, you know, you have to, again, look at your time horizon. You have to look at, you know, how, do I, how old are you? What is your, you know, mm -hmm. what is your strategy? Um, and I, I do think that there are times people get nervous, really, and it gets, you know, let's, for instance, when the pandemic started, the market went straight mm -hmm. down. And there was a lot of nervousness out there and people were panicking. Granted, there was something that hasn't gone on in a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful. Those are the ones that you don't want to panic. Yeah. You don't want to be selling those dumps, as we call them, on the Wall Street. And you don't want to be chasing these big rallies that happen for no apparent reason. Right. And you do have to look at the basic facts. Okay, what's going on in the economy, unemployment, inflation, the Federal Reserve, fiscal stimulus, and so on. But it is really up to you, the investor, to decide what is my longer term, you know, priorities here? At the beginning of the pandemic, I remember looking at the stocks and seeing things tumbling. At the time, I thought we'd all be off for two weeks. Um, <laughs> and, and I thought, right, and I thought to myself, well, it's bound to come back because I can see the factor that's in, that's impacting um, the price of stocks. But now I, it's hard to figure out whether or not we're seeing a dip or like a downward spiral because. It doesn't seem like things are turning around. Yeah. The, the dip was actually probably in mid-June. That was our dip this year where we went down mm -hmm. to about 3,700 on the S&P. The volatility index, which is the, called the VIX, that spiked to 35. There was nervousness again about inflation. We had a CPI print over, it was 9.1% on the inflation. People got really nervous really quickly. Mm -hmm. Now just the opposite. We've had a nice little run here for the last month and a half. And the question becomes, have we run too much? Have we, are we ready for a sell-off? This morning we're down 300 points in the Dow. More nervousness about inflation, recession. The Federal Reserve Chair is speaking on Friday at Jackson Hole, which is a big deal. A lot of people are waiting on that. So I think this week you'll see a lot of choppiness just back and forth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, is this a rip that you would sell or is this a dip that you would buy right now? I think we're kind of in between, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Mm -hmm. 3,700 was the low, 4,800 was the high last year. 
I think we're smack right in the middle, and I'm waiting. I think at this point, if I was an investor, I'm a trader, I trade for institutional clients, but I'd wait to see what goes on this week, see what the Federal Reserve kind of indicates. 50 basis points, 75 basis points. There's a lot of news still coming out, yeah. but it's certainly not a panic situation where I'd be really nervous, oh, inflation, recession, and so on, and it's certainly not a euphoric situation where I'd say, oh, this is fantastic, let's buy everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I, um, I, I, there's a chart that we used to use when I worked at Alliance Bernstein uh, when we would talk to retail investors um, to show them the life of the stock market from the market crash in the 1920s up until, you know, the housing crisis, for example. And we would show when you look at the market over the course of that long of a time frame, you essentially see it going up this way. But within those years, obviously, there are huge right. dips um, and huge increases in the stock market. But what you do see is that almost every dip, investor money coming out of the market retail investor money, and at every high, investor money pouring into the market. The opposite of what you Of what you should be do. doing, yeah. because when when the market is going up, everybody's talking about it. Remember when GameStop was yes. the thing? And I came in here, and everybody in the newsroom <laughs> is like, Vlad, what should I do? I, you know, I want to buy, I want to get in on that GameStop I know, thing, or right? what's the next GameStop? What's the next GameStop? <laughs> and then when it starts to go down, as inevitably they do, People are stuck. They don't know what should I wait? Should I wait for it to rebound? Yeah. So, so Joe, the question, of course, is can you explain to our audience um, what the risk tolerance that a, in, a, an investor who's trying to save for a kid's college or wants to buy a house versus an institutional investor who, when GameStop was at 100, they had already made their millions mm. and were looking to the next thing. So That's true. when mom and pop decided to buy yeah, GameStop. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't think most investors are, are picking individual names because to pick stocks, that's left for the pros, and they're doing a lot of work. Right, and they're doing all sorts of analysis on it. And I'm not saying an investor shouldn't be picking stocks. There are there are good stocks that you might want to own, but it is more of a riskier game than buying the averages. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're talking about is if we looked at the S&P 500 index for the last 50 years, you're going to see this relatively calm movement. Mm -hmm. But if you look at individual names, you're going to see some of yeah, this. Right, yeah. you want to buy some, you know, some of these more risky names, like you were saying. That's not for the, you know, for the faint of heart, as we say. But maybe you, if you have a, what they call a separate account, if you want to I don't call it play money, but a separate account yeah, if you want to trade. Getting, like, right. that you can risk it's not the mortgage. It. Right. right. And, and then there's the, you know, the 401ks and the 529 money. You know, my, my kids are both in college now. We had 529s for them, and I just left it in there. Yeah. And I didn't care what the market was right. doing. And those just kind of did its thing, like you said. Yeah. And, and, you know, the tax advantage, which is wonderful. But, but in that sense, you don't want to be playing the market. Right. And you don't. And like you said, the timing is the worst. We have a couple of friends who are registered investment advisors, and we say, hey, did you get any GMO calls when the market was panicking? And we call them get-me-out calls. <laughs> and that's that panic. That's that, yeah. oh, my God, get me out. That's a buy signal. Right. Okay. Right. That's, that's a buy, a buy signal. signal for every that's, institution. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Looking at it. That's that contrarian indicators. Yeah. There are a couple of them that are out right now, which is kind of signaling a little bit more bullishness. But it's when when investors get too bullish, the market. So I have dips. a question for you because now, like you know, you, we have access to all of this stuff. We can DIY our investments, and you know, our 401ks kind of allow us to go in there and shuffle things around if we want to. And every once in a while, somebody says to me, "Oh, you're too heavy on this," mm -hmm. and, and I'm like. This is just what they gave me, right? right? I, I mean, do you suggest that people kind of look at your 401k and, and fiddle around with it or just leave it? I mean, if you, if you want to tweak it every once in a while, I yeah. would certainly not trading it. You would do not want to trade your 401k. That's a big mistake. But if you want to tweak it a little bit where if you, you are getting a little more defensive and you think that they were, you know, we're heading into a, a situation, and so let's just say you're 50-50 stocks and bonds. And you want to kind of adjust that? That makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah. But it also doesn't make sense. To, it doesn't make sense to say, okay, um, you know, 65 years old. I'm about to retire. I'll go 100% stocks. Right. No, no, yeah. That's not what you want to do right now. Right. But there, you know, there are certainly advisors out there. You know, folks at Alliance Bernstein are great that, yeah. that take care of this and will get, will guide you along your way. But from my perspective, you know, I manage my own money and, and I'm invested in the stock market. I, but I, I'm on my 401k. I'm not moving it every day. Right. I'm leaving it alone. Right. Sometimes I'll get a little bit more tech heavy if I feel you know tech is good, or I may get a little bit more energy focused. Yeah. But just tweaking it around the edges. I, I just think it's you know um, I've been out of the game now almost 12, 13 years, and I you know I know the, the mechanics, but I don't. I'm not following this every day. I have no clue. So my money Even is with you. my no with my financial advisor who is a childhood friend and who you know we came up together. And uh, I you know I even during COVID. I don't. Th I think we talked once or twice. I was like, "Hey, what's going on? How's it looking? Bad. All right, I'll talk to you in a couple right. of years." Like you know, because like it's money that I'm gonna need when I'm retired, yeah. and I'm sure it's gonna be fine. Yeah. And I think that you know, if you, uh, the, you know, we don't want to be giving advice here too, because that's not what we do. But you know, if we used to say, if you are outperforming the S and P 500 by four or five percent every year, 
consistently every You're doing year. Good. You're doing great. Uh, who, you who's know? doing that, Vlad? I want to know. Who I, that I, exactly. <laughs> and, the, and, and people say, oh my God, 4%, that's nothing. <laughs> but there's a reason why the SEC says, you know, for people who are invested with hedge funds, like, we're not, we're, we, you know, you're on your own. If you decide you don't want those 3 or 4% returns and you want those high-octane returns that hedge funds or people who do it for a living like you are offering, have at it. But take the risk. Take the risk, but it's on your own risk. We can't come after them if you lose all your money. Right. <laughs> and, and to be a fair for hedge funds, a lot of them, they are, you know, it's, it's a little bit more risky strategy, but some of them are very focused on what they do. A lot of our clients are hedge funds. Some of them are short-focused. They're focused on short, short selling. Some of them are focused on energy. Some of them are focused on housing or real estate. So there's a lot more specific, you know, if you want to invest in that sector. And usually the bigger money managers will go and, and actually invest in those, in hedge, those hedge funds, funds as well. Right, sure. So, but, but I always say, if, if, if you have your investments out there and you're having trouble sleeping at night, if the markets are selling off and you're worried, well, then you have too much risk. Yeah. Then you need to sure. readjust your portfolio, take down that risk sum. And hey, there's nothing wrong with buying bonds. There's nothing, right. if, you, if you can hold them to maturity, sure. by the way, right. because those also, yeah, you know, the bond market's had a rough year this yeah. year as well, and they will fluctuate in price. But if you can hold them mature, you're, you're fine. But, but if you got too much you know, risk on there, then you do want to pair it back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, people should just, uh, just want to point out again, uh, right. all this stuff is really interesting to talk about. Right. But if you have real questions, please call your financial advisor. Yeah. <laughs> That's the uh, best I know, way to I'm go. not touching my 401k. <laughs> so this has been a very lovely conversation, Joe. Uh, Joe Saluzzi, thank you very Good much. Good to see you in studio. You too, as well. Yeah. <laughs> And coming up in our 7 p.m. hour, we will discuss 401ks versus Roth IRAs and everything you need to know about moving your money or perhaps not moving your money. If you've been listening to us, uh, tune in all week for uh, economic insights from our special series, An Uncertain Economy.